I told him at the uh, rehearsal that we had, <clears throat> uh, it's my private time of worship. I get to get, sit in here just all by myself and get to listen to them rehearse. And as I came up uh, with my time for mic check, <clears throat> I said, I know your stories, all of them. And I uh, understand that that's not just a song that we sing, but it's what we're living out. And I know many of your stories. And the battle is the Lord's. And He has the victory. And that's why we've gathered in this place. And thanks for much, so much, for being part of Get Well and what God is doing in this place. I don't know who this sermon is for today, this message is for. If you need to listen in on it, please do so. Let me take you to my office. Uh, for the last two weeks, I've been sitting there getting ready for today. And I took my legal pad. And on the top of that legal pad, I wrote, Building Holy Habits. That's our theme for today. Something we want to know how to do, right? Worthy topic. Next to that, I wrote Philippians 3, which will be our teaching text for today. And then I began to manually write out uh, the principles that I had found in Philippians 3. And so as I worked on that and I began to create an outline, I put those principles in place. And as I worked with those principles, I may move this one there and that one here. And as I prayed about it, as I looked at which principle needed to complement the next one, it just became so evident to me, Bill, you need this. Desperately need this. I don't know if it's like this for you, but it is for me, because I start out with great commitments. I can make a list of resolutions. I can do all the things that I want to um, add to my life. It may be something like I want to eat better. Uh, I don't want to waste as much time on TV. I want to be device free when I'm with family so I can be engaged with family. I want to get physically healthy. I also can add the spiritual elements of the spiritual disciplines that I want to be uh, part of my life. So I've got my list. That, that's no problem. Because when I have my list, here's what happens. Uh, life happens. I have another responsibility, uh, another requirement to, to my life. I need to be there. I need to meet with this person. I need to do this. And before I turn around, because life has happened, everything that I had on my list just kind of goes away. And I find myself right back where I started. I don't know if I'm alone in that. I don't think so. Because for Bill, I have no trouble in making a list. All my life, I've been good at making a list. The breakdown is because I'm focusing on the list and I'm not looking at the how and the why I want to accomplish that list. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you need to listen in on today's topic, please do so. Uh, back of your bulletin, we've got some principles that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we began this sermon series on habits because we thought, what better time for us to talk about habits that at the beginning of a new decade, beginning of a new year, uh, where we're more attentive to resolutions and habits that we want to apply to our life. Also, uh, we are more sensitive to what God has for us in our life. That's just something about January. So we wanted to focus in on habits. Uh, last week, Jonathan talked about uh, the different cyclical things that we have that cause habits in us. The triggers, the routines, and our response, and those kind of things. So uh, today, I get to look at the practical side of building holy habits. The how, and also 
the why. So I was in my office, a holy place. Come by and visit. You can feel the aura that's there. <laughs> but as I was back there uh, dealing with this, uh, Philippians was the teaching text. Interesting thing about Philippians. Philippians has four books. As you look at the different four books, uh, you can see that uh, each one has a subtopic that we're going to talk about uh, today on chapter 3. Interesting because Paul wrote this book of Philippians um, to a church in Philippi, a church that he established on his second missionary journey. The interesting thing is that Philippians is known as a book about joy. Interesting because you have to look back where Paul was when he wrote about joy. Uh, Paul wrote this book while he was under house arrest, according to Acts 28, verse 30 and 31, where he could not move around, he could not preach, he could not do ministry, he was under house arrest. He was waiting trial before the Roman government. He was also chained, he was shackled to a, a Roman soldier. So it is so interesting that Paul could write about joy when he's under those circumstances because nothing in uh, the circumstances he had would point toward joy. The focus would not there, not produce joy at all. So how did he do that? Good question. As you look at Philippians, the four chapters, each one has a subheading uh, that Paul says the reason you can talk about joy deals with attitude. Chapter 1, if you want the quick synopsis there, is a single-minded attitude. Something that we quote in Philippians 1.21, so often for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So it is a single-minded attitude. Chapter 2 uh, deals with the attitude of submissive mind. It talks about humility. It talks about putting others ahead of yourself. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 3 momentarily, but chapter 4, if we skip over to there, uh, chapter 4 has an attitude of a secure mind, something that is like an anchor, something that holds you in the storms, not allowing things like worry, things like circumstances, things like wrong feelings to capture your mind, but for you to understand all the resources that you have in Christ. So we have different attitudes throughout the chapters. Now, chapter 3, we have the attitude of spiritual mindedness. What we want to talk about today, how we can build holy habits. Because as I worked on this, I found the principles that Paul was teaching about how we could be spiritually minded and how we could build holy habits. So let's begin here. You can follow along back of your bulletin. And this is a twist in words that caused me to push pause as I sat in my office. I had not thought about it like this. But Paul wrote in verse 10, it's going to be on the screen if you don't have your Bible. It says, I want to know Christ and the power of of his resurrection. So let's call time out. Here's a question you need to wrestle with just as I wrestled with in my office. The question, do you really, really, really want to know Christ? This is not a hope so answer. This is not if it's convenient type of answer. This is not if nothing else is going on type of answer. But it must come from a plea that comes from your heart. I want to know more of Christ. So if that answer is yes, I want to know more of Christ, what is our default mechanism? Normally we think I need to add spiritual habits, spiritual disciplines to my life. And that's true. I need to read God's Word. I need to pray more. I need to meditate. I need to serve. I need to worship corporately. I need to add whatever you want to add in those spiritual habits and disciplines. 
But what I came to understand that caused me to push pause that I hope you will wrestle with today is this. It's from a conversation that Becky and I were having about a completely different topic. And that completely different topic, she was talking about an author that she had been reading. And the author, to paraphrase what he said, was that we so often think about it in spiritual discipline when really it's just spiritual delight. Let that settle, folks. That I get to delight in reading God's Word. I get to delight in praying and conversation with God. That I get to delight in confessing my sins and understanding that as I confess whatever, however much, that He is faithful and just to forgive me of those sins. The word discipline gives us the idea of something we have to do. It's a checklist. It's something that is uh, impounded on us, if you allow me to use that word. A delight is a get to. I get to be with this creator who created me, who wants a relationship with me. Now, if the word discipline works for you, use it. If delight works for you, use it. The thing that I encourage you to do is whatever discipline or delight, just do what it's causing us to uh, enter into relationship with God. Do I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection? Well, that leads us to the second principle uh, from Philippians 3. If I want to build these holy habits, these, this delight in my time with God, then the next principle I, th I have to think about is this. And that principle deals with goals versus systems. Goals versus system. I've been reading this book. <clears throat> uh, it's Compound Effect. It was written by Darren Hardy. Uh, the subtitle of it is Jumpstart Your Income, Your Life, Your Success. I was given rise uh, information on this from Craig Rochelle as I follow and read about him because he said, this is required reading of all my children. So Becky and I bought a copy of this book, and we gave it to Ben and to Jenny and their family uh, this past Christmas. And Becky and I have been reading this uh, book as well. Uh, he is a Christ follower, so as he talks about the secular part of, the, of your life, he also puts in some principles there uh, for our growth spiritually. He made this statement in the book. He said, think five years back. The goals that you set five years ago, have they been achieved? Well, that was an easy answer for Bill. No. Have not. And Hardy explained, goals don't determine success. Or in my case, uh, my list. That doesn't determine success. He says, systems determine success. Goals alone don't give us uh, the end desire. Systems of our life determine success. Hardy says in this book, he says, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your system. So for Bill... I had to look inwardly for a long time, and I realized I do not have a system that is consistent in order for me to establish a growth pattern spiritually. I may have a want to. It may be rattling around in my mind, but things happen. Life happens. People call. There's emergencies. Hardy says that we have to Carve out a time, an appointment with God that is a non-negotiable. Outside of a family emergency, that is your time with God. It's a time in which you are going to uh, spend, whether it's 30 minutes or whatever it is, 
for you, but you calendar that as an appointment, just as you do an appointment with a doctor. And it is non-negotiable. That statement also about rising to your goals, uh, but falling to the level of your system caused me to think about this because it's in the book. It says creating a system doesn't sound very spiritual at all. And it doesn't. Creating systems, it doesn't sound very spiritual until you begin to read the Bible looking through the eyes of successful people that you read about in the Bible and asking what is a system that they had established in order for them to be successful. Take, for instance, Daniel. In my accountability group, uh, we studied uh, Daniel, life of Daniel, uh, this past year. What was the system that allowed Daniel to rise above another bunch of young men? What was the system that Daniel had in place that when he was put in the lion's den, uh, because of that system, he was able to be obedient and trust God to deliver him from that giant that he was facing in those lions? Well, he had predecided, his system is that he was going to meet with God three times a day. It got him into trouble, it got him into the lion's den. But he had a predetermined system that when life seemed to get out of whack, it was his fallback. And I had to think about the system that Bill had in place. If you and I want to grow in our faith, if you and I want to be more faithful, then you and I will not rise to the level of our goals, but we will fall to the level of our system because we started this year thinking we're going to knock reading through the Bible out in one year this year. But then life happens. You and I have to have a system in strengthening and knowing uh, more of God. Here is how... Uh, we see that system in Paul in verse 12 and verse 13 of Philippians 3. Let's look at it together because it says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Now, the word press on there in Greek, it is... Uh, carries the idea of a follow after. It has the idea of intense endeavor. It gives us a hunting motif of a hunter eagerly uh, pursuing his prey. Our attitude of spiritual mind is intense pursuit. You, like me, we have a great list of spiritual goals. But our focus most of the time is on the list and not on the what or on the how. Craig Groeschel challenges us in de developing this system. He tweeted it this week if you follow him. Uh, but anytime you read, he says this statement. Successful people consistently do what other people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. So your homework, your takeaway in principle number two, uh, what's your goals and what's your system in place to achieve that goal? That brings us to the third principle we find for building spiritual delights, these holy habits. Again, it was a heart check for me. I wrestled with this. You have to wrestle this to the ground as well. When we begin to struggle and have trouble doing the hard work of achieving the list of goals or adding holy habits, it's common to believe that we are not successful because we don't have the willpower. We have to put our shoulder against the grindstone and we're going to do that come hell or high water. I'm going to do this and nothing's going to stop and before we know it, our willpower wanes. And so for your fill in the blank, it's not about willpower, but it's about why power, W-H-Y. The why power. 
It's not enough to choose to change and add spiritual habits. The key question for you and for me is what is going to keep you consistent? What is going to keep you from not stopping and falling back to where you were before? What is going to be different this time than the last time? What is the why power that's driving it? Because willpower will fail you. It failed me. Has it failed you? My encouragement for you is to forget about willpower and focus on the why. If you're taking notes on your just in your bulletin, you might want to write this down because your choices are, are only meaningful when you connect them to your dreams and your desires. Only as you have a connect, that's when it comes to full, the fullness that we need. Uh, you and I, uh, we we see the wisest and most motivating choices of our life are the ones that align with what we identify as our purpose, as our core values, and also as our highest values. When we connect those choices, then they begin to gain ground. This might help you. Suppose I had a two by six inch board, and it was 10 feet long. And I called you up here and I said, I will give you $20 for you to walk the length of that board from one end to the next. You would not hesitate. You would have lunch money. Suppose I take that same two by six and I put it across two buildings and the buildings are 100 stories high. And I tell you, okay, I'll give you $20 if you walk across that board. And you will say, Bill, you're crazier than I thought you were. You had another hair root die. <laughs> but what if I tell you that your child is on top of that other building and that building is burning? You wouldn't even consider the $20. You would walk it without question. What changed? Uh, the board's the same. The reward on my part's the same. But for you, it's different because you see the why of what you want to go after. That's what we need to identify for us. The willpower or the why we want that to happen. Uh, we can play, we can see Paul's why power in verse 13. You know, back of your bulletin, it's on the screen. It says, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. And here's the why. To win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Identifying the why power gives us momentum. Identifying the why uh, for us, it's not about a checklist of getting it done, but it brings fulfillment. Because he has given me, as Paul says, the prize for which God has called me heavenward. I want that to be fulfilled in my life. As I was reading another book, I give you this one line statement worthy of your hearing. It says, when people lose their way, they lose their why. So, for you, for me, what is our why? That is our takeaway for principle number three, which is an excellent segue to our fourth principle that I found. Uh, in Philippians 3. And I spent most of my time wrestling with this fourth principle. So far, we have listed the principles of discipline versus delight, goals versus system, willpower versus why power. Here is a principle that caused me to push back the weeds and for me to see where I am in this. It's the principle of do versus who. 
This principle may sound shallow, it may sound simple, but it's huge for us to understand. If you read Philippians 3.16, Paul is saying, we got to do what we know that God's already told us uh, to do. Uh, that is understanding who we are. He's already given us all the information that we need. No doubt, this time of year, we're making resolutions. We're making holy habits uh, that we want to do. On my legal pad, I wrote this statement. It is not what I do, but it is who I want to become. When this one and only life of mine is finally over, what do I want people to say about the legacy that I leave behind? More importantly, when this one and only life is over, and I stand before the only one who is worthy to judge me for the way in which I've lived this life, what do I want my Savior to say about me? That's why I wrote that down. What are your who go goals? You might say, I want to be a true man of God, and that's a great who goal. I want to be clean and sober. Fantastic who goal. I want to be a godly mom, a godly spouse. I want to be financially free in four years. I want to be a bold witness for people that are in my school. I want to be a healthy person. What is it you want to become? Identifying who we want to be shapes and motivates everything we do because it funnels right into that answer. Who I want to be. Don't start with the do, but start with the who. When you know who you are, then you know what to do, simply because you know who you are in Christ. So who are you? I want to speak these words over you. Words of blessing just so you know who you are. You are redeemed in the Lord. Your righteousness is found in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer. You are blessed. You are a child of the Most High God. You can do all things who, through Christ. Who gives you strength? There's nothing that you've ever done that's going to cause God to love you less. There's nothing you can ever do that's going to cause God to love you more. God loves you just as much as an almighty God, creator God, can love his creation. You are chosen. You are his. You have a purpose in his kingdom. You do. God has equipped you, shaped you, molded you. And God calls you into the high honor of using your gifts, using your story, no matter how hard that story has been, for the purpose of His kingdom and growing His kingdom. He gives you that privilege. That is who you are. Simply telling others, this is who I was before, but because I met Jesus, this is who I am today. I am a loved child of God, transformed because of Him. That is who you are. The truth for this life, if you want to have more, you've got to become more. Because as we become and move toward that goal, that desire, and everything we do drives us toward that end result. Lately, uh, in the funerals that I've been privileged to, to lead and conduct, uh, here's what I've shared with those families. Uh, 
You know the routine. How we celebrate a life. How pallbearers carry the casket out to the hearse. And how we go in procession out to a cemetery. And how the pallbearers would take that casket and they will walk to that grave site. And they'll put that casket underneath the green tent. And then they turn the service back over to the pastor. And so lately as we've stood under that green tent, I've shared with those families. I said, I want you to look out. I want you to see all these marble tombstones. Every one of them representing a life that has been lived. It's got a beginning date. It's got a closing date. As I stand there, I said, say to them, as you look out and you see all these tombstones that just dot lined up so perfectly, I want you to know that Jesus defeated that. But for those of us who now have breath, have an opportunity for another moment, another day, another whatever, I share with you this statement that I found from C.H. Spurgeon. And that statement says this, A good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. So carve your name on hearts and not on marble. So get well. Truly God-honoring people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Do I want to know? Christ. I give you these four words. The four words delight, systems, why, who. Let me pray. Not sure how long we've been part of a church been part of that system right now what we wrestle with is do we really want to know you Uh, we have to answer that we have to wrestle with that and Lord at the beginning of this year what better time for us to start than right now Uh, with all of those principles and all the takeaways Thank you for loving us enough to do what you did what you did for us. We don't take that for granted. I pray for my brothers and sisters just as I pray for myself that as we wrestle this to the ground that we come up and we say from the depths of my heart, our heart, yes, only you. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Lord, you take control of our time of singing this last song. You do among us what only you can do. It's not what Bill says. It's what, what you want to do and how we respond. So you be glorified. It's in the sweetest name we can say that we offer this prayer. And that name is Jesus. Will you stand? Kansas uh, sings, altar rails are open. Uh, people are here to pray. Uh, how desperately do we want Him? How do we want to use 2020 uh, for our next step? As we sing, let's listen to Him and may we respond. Let's sing together. <laughs>